Welcome, everyone. Uh, happy New Year. Uh, my name is Rita McGrath. You probably knew that. A couple of just housekeeping reminders. Uh, this is being recorded for posterity, so don't say anything you don't want your grandmother or significant other to find out about. Um, my, uh, my, my heartfelt welcome to you for our first Friday Fireside Chat of 2023, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Richard, or Dick Rimmelt as we know him, uh, to be my guest this week. Uh, he's got a fantastic Still pretty new book out, right? It just came out recently um, called The Crux. And uh, we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about a new um, advisory concept that he's got called The Foundry and whatever else he feels like talking about. So, uh, Dick, very hearty welcome. Thank you, Rita. I appreciate uh, appearing, appearing on your fireside chat. <laughs> it's great. So I thought I'd open up with um, Something a little provocative, which is uh, you have recently talked about an epidemic of bad strategy. <laughs> Could you maybe elaborate on what you mean by that? Well, we used to use the word strategy to describe a company's approach to how it competes. Pretty obvious. And uh, somehow in the past 20 years, I think, really, if you, if you look at it, uh, there's been some kind of victory of finance, I think. And uh, more and more strategies are simply uh, that, that people write about or do mm -hmm. descriptions of goals and ambitions. Mm -hmm. And these are fine. I mean, everybody has to have ambitions. And, uh, but, but goals are not a strategy. They are, they are ambitions in some sense. Uh, uh, typically, I will I will visit a company, and uh, the senior, the lead CEO, will say, "Here's our strategy." And he'll show me some powerpoints, and basically, the powerpoints are a, they're a sales job mm -hmm. to investors and then the board mm -hmm. about what we're going to achieve over the next three years, mm -hmm. maybe five, but usually about three. And uh, it, it's an ROI goal. There's an ROE goal. There's a growth and earnings goal. Um, and then the strategy is typically something like we're going to invest in the growing areas of our market. Which, you know, I'm thinking about having a little card made that says our strategy is best in the growing areas of the market, which <laughs> is going to be every, every person's strategy. You could get a t-shirt. You could yeah, have a whole right. line of swag around that. There you go. <laughs> t-shirt. Oh, Maybe I can sell that. And make some, there you go. Make some swag. And uh, that's not a strategy. Uh, it's it's not horribly bad in the sense of uh, it's not uh, bump, but it it's not a strategy. And uh, strategy, ever since the time of the Greeks, the word it, it is about facing a problem, a challenge. It's about we're outnumbered on the battlefield. What do we do? It's about if you're in Athens, where the strategion still still a piece of ground where the strategion sits is still there, which is the building where the strategoi would come and discuss strategy. Uh, we have a plague. What do we do? Um, we're running out of money. What do we do? And so, strategy is about dealing with challenges. Uh, the national security strategy of the United States, which got published recently, identifies China, competition with China, and to a less extent Russia as major challenges, which is different because mm -hmm. in the old days, it was about terrorists. Mm -hmm. And what it doesn't say, well, why is this hard? Mm -hmm. What is the difficulty we have in dealing with this? Mm -hmm. It recommends sort of multilateral, multi, everybody should coordinate with everybody else mm -hmm. as, a, as an ambition. Mm -hmm. But when you see that as an ambition, you know mm -hmm. that there's a problem in coordinating, otherwise they wouldn't put it up there as an ambition. You know, my ambition is to uh, lose weight, that maybe <laughs> I have a problem with. My ambition <laughs> is to grow hair. <laughs> Maybe it's because uh, I don't have any hair. But you, to do a strategy, you need to get into the uh, details of why is this hard? What is the nature of the challenge? And how do I actually overcome it? Mm -hmm. 
Which I thought was great. And, and you know, the, the, that's really the theme of the book, which is to remind people and for those that maybe joined a little late, the book is called The Crux. And it really gets to this essence of uh, what you talk about, which is, you know, what is the crux of the situation we're facing? And um, and you have some criteria for what makes something um, a, you know, what makes something a reasonable strategy. So it's got to be something that's addressable, right? That, you know, you can identify a problem that's really hard, but if there's nothing you can do about it, then that's not where you should focus your efforts, which I think is quite an interesting uh, point. Um, so you talk about strategy as problem solving, um, focusing of strength against a particular opportunity or problem. And I thought that was a really sound way of thinking about it. Um, the other thing I love about the book is you actually go through a lot of examples, one one famous one being Netflix, right? And uh, um, and as you think about, you know, they created a category, right? Yeah. So that's awesome. Now everybody else is going, oh, we want a piece of that. So that changes the strategic landscape and it fits really well with what I've talked about for years, which is strategies have life cycles and expiration dates. And right. you know, in any one time, you could be building one, you could be exploring mm-hmm. Or you could be facing the fact that it's eroding. And a lot of our strategy texts don't even acknowledge that. They talk about sustainable competitive advantages and nothing ever changed. Well, it's funny because I wrote the the chapter that features Netflix in early 2000. Ah, mm -hmm. And uh, I I pushed it back uh, really a year and a half to 1998. Mm -hmm. And where Netflix was first really confronting this challenge from alternate uh, other streaming uh, platforms. And still uh, my publisher uh, wanted to advertise the book as uh, shows why Netflix is such a great successful company. You know, and so I, that wasn't what I did. It wasn't what I wrote. Um, what I wrote is, is about why the challenge that Netflix actually faced and my own ruminations about how it might move to, to deal with that. Um, well, you know, that's it looks way. like it's, it's the shootout at the OK Corral now. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> We're talking war of attrition space, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's ugly out there. But, you know, this also gets to one thing that I don't know about you, but for years this has frustrated me, which is, you know, a company, whether by its own actions or about something that happens in the environment gets into trouble, right? And all of a sudden, every good thing that company's ever done is put in the dustbin. Yeah. And, uh, and and every smart move they've ever made is all of a sudden disregarded. And the same thing with really good companies, like, I don't care how smart you are. If you're a travel agency and it's December of 2019, you're not going to have a good couple of years. Right, right. <laughs> so- so, I, I used to have a talk I would do, exploiting the fact that I'm, I'm old. And uh, yeah, I, I would uh, put up, uh, this, this really worked when I had transparencies Yeah, <laughs> back in those days. And I, I'd go up to the podium and I'd, I'd put that, uh, I'd say, so let's talk about best corporate practice. And I'd put down this thing that described General Motors. I said, oh, geez, this is my, this is my slide from 1963. Um, <laughs> I, it, it's no longer relevant. It's, well, they, they, they used to be, this was the model everybody used to do recommend you do this because it was the most successful company, but I take it aside. I'll say, here's the recommendations. I put that, oh, no, this is IBM during its heyday. This is the how to manage. Uh, put that aside. And then I put down Intel or, or, and I'd gradually move it up to the present saying, you know, basically the recommendations of how to manage are look at the most successful company and write down what they do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so today it was Google. Apple, and uh, the lesson of the lecture, if anybody's actually listening, is that well, this too will pass, and there will be new models and new ways of doing things. So it don't take your, don't necessarily take your uh, ideas from the most successful company, although it's not. Uh, you should look at it, but this yes, most successful company usually has more money. Then God, it's just really, really rolling and go. And they can afford to do things that other companies don't do. They can afford to give you one-year sabbaticals to their best engineers. And they can afford this and they can afford that. So maybe those aren't what's making it successful. Maybe mm-hmm. you've got to look deeper. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so one of them, and I wanted to go back to, you know, our earliest days of kind of interacting with each other. And um, you did some of the very earliest work on industry effects versus company effects. And I believe yeah. the bottom line to that was it really comes down to business units. Yes, it did. There was, uh, well, that, in those days, we were competing with industrial organization, yes. the economics view of the world. And their view of the world was that any profits above very low levels were due to monopoly power. And monopoly power came from concentration. And so concentrated industries were the source of high profits. Um, and so I was trying to see if that was true. And uh, yeah, the, the, the paper took, there was a famous economist who wrote a piece for the American Economic Review saying that, yeah, he's looked at the data that the FTC has gathered, and sure enough, it's all about industry. And I looked at the same data. It took me a year, years to get access, and uh, he wasn't right. He had assigned, uh, I did it differently. And uh, he, uh, most of the variance in the data came from business unit effects within corporations. Mm -hmm. And there's been a big controversy since then about whether corporate effects are big or small or medium. Now, I found them to be small. People looking at the CompuStat line of business data find them to be medium. Now, I've never done the CompuStat line of business data. Uh, I find it very messy. Um, but the initial, the basic result that business unit effects are quite large, uh, much larger than industry effects, uh, remains. Mm -hmm. It's still, uh, it's still what everybody finds when they look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, and in a way that really supports the thesis of the book, right? Which is depending on where you're putting your strategic decision making capability, um, you know, the the leaders that have identified the right kind of challenge and problem and then focus their attention on it um, are likely to be more successful than those that perhaps have not. And that's going to vary by business unit to business unit, which I think is well, really- The other thing, uh, Rita, that I do mm -hmm. in the book is I try to say, look, if you're going to redefine strategy as problem solving, mm -hmm. rather than how do I compete in this market, which is a, a slightly different turn, mm -hmm. then maybe your problem is political or maybe mm -hmm. your problem is your internal organization is, is something's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And so if you take that point of view, you're mm -hmm. led to the idea that, well, strategy is about organization too. It's not like a separate subject mm -hmm. that your most strategic action might be to fix the organization. Um, well, and you have a whole chapter on power and the, the and power, yes, uh, which which I thought was really interesting for a book on strategy. Um, one of my uh, other guests has been Jeff Pfeffer, uh, who has mm -hmm. this terrific book, you know, Seven Rules of Power, and uh, and nice yes, yes, sorry. Nice book, Jeff. It's a great book. Yeah, it's really good. Um, but one of the things I love about the way Jeff talks about it, he says, look, if you want to play soccer, you play by the rules of soccer. If you want to play human society, you play by the rules of human society. And that involves uh, how we are programmed to respond to these cues and signals and manifestations of power. And you basically come at that same argument from a slightly different direction, which is if you're going to be focusing effort and, and concentrating on making some choices, and by definition, not others, you're going to have political dimensions to whatever you're doing. That's right. And, and someone's going to have to break the political deadlocks. You know, there are times when you want to let a hundred flowers bloom, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in research and development. If you're mm -hmm. doing that kind of thing. I mean, look, look at a, a good university system. You don't want a dictator telling all the researchers what to research. Mm -hmm. Because you know that only one in a hundred is ever going to come up with something to, to say the unsayable. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're a group that's lost in the forest and you want to decide which way to go, you have a, a group challenge, then letting everybody go in the direction they want to go in, is, you have a different kind of issue that arises. Mm -hmm. And typically, someone's got to make the choice. Someone's got to say, well, we're going to go downhill and see if we can find a river. 
um, and that kind of that's hierarchy that leads to decision making. So we don't have uh, so so we can concentrate our energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I just did a an intervention with a company where you know they they, they, they were arguing. We said, well, we don't, isn't strategy a democratic process? No, we listen to everybody. And I said, sure, you listen to everybody, but then someone's got to decide which voice, uh, which idea, which diagnosis to give the most weight to, because you mm -hmm. can't do everything that everybody says. Mm -hmm. And this is a hard pill to swallow for, particularly for millennials, but for a lot of people who somehow want to believe that their companies or their organizations are, they rarely use the word democratic, but they, they talk about bottom. And uh, it's, yeah, bottom up, sure. You want the flow of information about what's going on everywhere to, to percolate through the organization. But when you make a choice for the organization, then a strategic choice then that's got to come from either a leader or a, a leadership group. Uh, that's why we have hierarchies. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have hierarchies because we love them to be bossed around. We have mm -hmm. hierarchies because you can't do everything that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. And that information pooling too. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the other points that you make that I really like in the book, and then I'm, I'd, I'd like to move on to how you intervene with companies, is that you don't pick a strategy, you create it. And that sounds so simple to say, but there's a lot of richness in that. And um, I think the theory that kind of goes with that, you talk about design in the book. Um, there's another theory that we talk about abduction, you know, mm -hmm. so deduction, induction, and abduction, which has gotten much less attention, particularly in academic circles, but yeah. it sort of goes together with that idea of design, right? Right, right. I mean, I, my original career, I was a design engineer, and uh, what I learned about design, I learned at Jet Propulsion Laboratories. I didn't learn in engineering school. And uh, when you design something, you're, you're taking some kind of specification, which is a challenge, and you're trying to evolve, create, abduct, abduct a, uh, a way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same is in strategy. You're, you've got a complex situation, and you're trying to abduct a way of dealing with it. It's amazing. I mean, if I look at my emails that I get at my university address, which is easily available, just a lot of people, despite the fact that what I write in my books, are write to me and say, look, I've got to write a strategy statement. How do I do it? Mm -hmm. And you know, they want a, they want sort of an outline, like you have with these business plans that students are forced to go through the exercise of creating a business plan. And uh, you know, well, I, the bosses said I have to write a strategy, and what do I put in it? Uh, and that's <laughs> so strategy becomes a literary form where you have to state your mission and then you have to state your values and then you have to state your ambitions and then you state your policies. And usually that doesn't lead anywhere because you're not solving a problem. Uh, if you're if you're trying to uh, compete with China. One of the problems is the industrial base in the U.S. has been hollowed out. Well, they don't want to say that. Uh, I was on a I was on a defense industrial base study team back in the seventies, where we were we were meeting in Washington. And we were discussing, well, nobody makes a machine tool anymore in the United States. They're all made abroad. Is that a problem? And some of us said, yeah, yeah, sure, it's a problem because you, the skill of making machine tools is lost. Mm -hmm. And other people say, no, we just buy them from Japan. They make good machine tools. Mm -hmm. Well, now we buy them from China and they make pretty good machine tools. We buy big parts for naval ships, military ships from China because there's nobody in the US to make those parts anymore. And so, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, if you've got a competitor, but you have to buy critical parts from the competitor, if 
if China can build 20,000 miles of high-speed train in a decade and we can't build any, it's a problem. And people say, oh, well, you know, we can't build any because, they, you know, they, they sort of halt there. It's political. It's too expensive. It's this and that. But the reality is it's because there's nobody in the United States that knows how to do it. That you don't just take engineers and say, go build this. That once you don't do it anymore, the skill of doing it, the political skill, the infrastructure skill, the engineering skill, the actual boots on the ground skill, they're gone. And you don't have it. And uh, the, so there's a lot more to this than money. And that's my new interest right now. As is engineering skills across the board. Oh, interesting. That's very cool. So um, one of our um, listeners has asked, um, and they're using the case of Bed Bath & Beyond, like what would you advise them? But I think it's one example of perhaps a broader class of questions, which is company calls you, they've got issues. <laughs> like, how, do you, how do you take them through? And then maybe talk about your concept of the foundry, because I think it's right. so <clears throat> Yeah, I write about the strategy foundry in the last three chapters of the crux. And uh, I've actually applied for a trademark strategy foundry. We'll, we'll see if it holds. Um, and, you know, when I was younger, I would take on the assignment of trying to figure out the strategy of Bed Bath and & Beyond and uh, try to be a little McKinsey. And I, you know, sometimes it works a bit, but in general, sitting there and analyzing all their costs and all their buyer data and all that. It's, it doesn't produce a strategy that tells you what to do. That what? That tells you what to do. Mm -hmm. It tells you something about what's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's useful. And over time, I began to realize that the, that the strategy issues like companies was really that the senior team was having trouble defining the critical challenge and doing something about it. That they weren't ignorant. They knew about the market. They knew about the customers. They knew about their costs. They knew about all these things that, <clears throat> that the consulting industry digs up and they didn't know all the numbers, but they knew about the issues. Um, and, but there was a problem in, in reaching a decision. And that very often the, the strategies they were coming up with, the typical strategies would be a, a deal. We merge with somebody, we sell the company, we sell off a piece of the company, some kind of investment banking led uh, solution to the problem, which isn't really a solution, but it, it, it tosses it into someone else's hands. Which, if the senior management team is incompetent, is maybe the best thing. Uh, but Perhaps they're not. Perhaps they're just having trouble sorting through things. And so a strategy foundry is where I, I get together with hopefully a group of seven or nine, uh, an odd number of senior leaders. The CEO has to be there. And we engage in typically a three-day uh, knockdown, drag out uh, meeting offsite, hopefully, about strategy. And they have to agree. To, to take a challenge-based approach. Mm -hmm. And the first, the first day of this of the thing is basically going over, getting them, getting their feet wet and looking at, at these kinds of things. And so we start with things that they're familiar with, like what's changed in your industry? What are you proud of? What are you not so proud of? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Uh, and then gradually getting into well, what, are you, what are your threats? What are the biggest challenges you face? And then the other side of that, which is what are the programs you're engaging in right now and what challenges are they designed to meet, which surfaces new challenges. And then the second day is we, we really begin to sort through these challenges. Typically a, a company of any size can generate a list of 20 to 25 challenges. I mean, if it does it right away, I mean, some of them are big and you split them into pieces and say, well, you've got to. And, and once you begin to see you've got a lot of challenges going and that one of the big sources of lack of cohesion at the top is the different challenges that you face and which ones 
And, and there are yeah, challenges, of course, attached to resources for different groups of people, different divisions, different parts of the company. And uh, so part of the foundry is to enforce uh, a logic of which of these challenges is the most important, most critical, uh, and which can actually be addressed in the future with something we can do. Because some of these are, we have no idea how to address them. Oh, every president that comes into office wants to cure cancer. Okay, well, how do you do that? More money for research. Well, you know, maybe that'll work over the long term. It's not a, uh, a sudden rush of money isn't the answer. Um, and none of them say we're going we're to solve the homeless problem because they, they sort of in their gut know that they have no idea how to do that. Um, and so, yeah, we sort challenges into which are really important and which are less important and, and which can we make some headway on. And everybody, people typically disagree on these assessments. And so I find ways of pooling it. Mm -hmm. I can have them vote. Uh, the last foundry I did, uh, I had them come up and sign their name. We had these on sticky things that are on the wall. And you, you got to sign uh, three. And then we looked at, uh, out of the group of nine, uh, how many uh, signatures were on each one. And uh, CEO got to sign only three. And out of that, we got two challenges that were both important and, and uh, doable. And then we worked on, okay, so what do we actually do to do it? Refine this into actions that can be taken in the next six to 18 months. And by actions, I don't mean goals, I mean tasks, mm -hmm. things that we will do. And that's that's hard. That isn't strategy to so many people. So mm -hmm. many people's strategy. Oh, I know. And people talk about, oh, that's just tactics or, oh, that's just execution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the difference between strategy and tactics is the difference between the general and the sergeant. It's not about time frames or everything else. And uh, it's also just habits inside big companies. So there, there's a tendency when you're talking about strategy to make it about the future, which gets you off the hook about doing anything. And in many, many companies, the strategy is basically a set of goals that defines next year's budget. Mm -hmm. and so they do a three-year budget called strategy, and that gives you next year's budget. And I'm trying to break that. I'm trying to say that that isn't strategy. Let's do strategy properly. What are your big problems? Then we get into all sorts of interesting questions that I find the most interesting, which are, how do we present this to the people? People are used to seeing a strategy document from the top that tells everything that everybody does. That, that everybody's important in the strategy document. And my approach is that no, some things are more important than others. And so there's this is sort of, how do we deal with that? And part of the answer is the literary flow. <laughs> and part of the answer is, is ensuring everybody that this is an ongoing process. This is what's important for the next 18 months, but then we'll do it again. And we'll constantly have it circling around of what's critical and what's important. Uh, but just because we have an importance list doesn't mean everything else doesn't matter. It just has to do with the fact that we can't do everything at once. Mm -hmm. And then there's the issue of getting agreement among these people who met and getting them to socially and politically bond with each other in a way that they're not going to undercut. And I do that by making it explicit as best I can. The, the, the interesting thing is we have no science of this, that we've done a lot of research on strategy, but we haven't done research on how a group of people should arrive at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, there's huge amounts of academic research on it problem solving and group problem solving, but it's all done by teachers and students. I mean, it's not about real people with years of experience. 
uh, who have different pools of information. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there, really. Um, there's sort of a group think literature and some other things about stuff that can go wrong. But there's almost no recommendation on how to do it correctly. So that, that's what I'm interested in, in addition to the engineering problem, is this strategy foundry is really my attempt to, to, to find a way to get a group of people to arrive at a strategy that's meaningful rather than a, a bunch of ambitions, a list of ambitions. That's that's very cool, um, and you know what what I find interesting too is is that's not the problem many of the traditional consulting firms are set up to address, right? No, no, no. They, they most of them have, have merged their strategy practice and with their finance practice, so they're yeah. they're in there trying to help people increase their stock price. But yeah, good luck with that <laughs> as an engineering problem. Well, and in the book, you know, you talk about. Um, the reality that the stock price and your level of profits or strategic success are not correlated the way we often think they are. Yeah, yeah, it's all over the place. And, you know, sort of this idea that if you if you grow a little faster, your stock price will go up. Yeah, is... no, no, not at all. Um, My growth companies, uh, I'm trying to put together a little paper on this right now. My growth companies are interesting because if you knew a company was going to grow, 12% a year for the next 10 years. Um, the stock price wouldn't grow at 12%. percent we grow at the cost of capital. So why do companies grow? Why do stock prices grow? Well, they grow because no one really thinks it's going to do that for the next 10 years. And each year that it keeps it up is a surprise. And so you get this boom, boom, boom. And then when it stops growing, you get this boom. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm working with one right now, which is um, kind of unglamorous. Um, and it's been it's been sold a couple of times by owners yeah. who sort of wanted to hand the problem to somebody else, and and yet they're a really good company. They've got a great culture. They work together really well, and every year they're kind of surprising the market. And you know what they're seeing is exactly that effect. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, that's the that's the actual growth trajectory. Look at Amazon. How many years people are just how can this company keep right. increasing its revenue and not making any money? And well, I think people have misunderstood Amazon for yeah, a long yeah. time. Um, and, and I think they'll misunderstand Amazon now. That well, it made a lot of money. It just reinvested. Uh, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And it compensated people on the basis of increases in stock price. So, you know, you had yeah. this really kind of longer term thinking embedded, right? In, in oh, we, have, we have companies now where there's almost no invested capital. There's not, I mean, in terms of there's no plant and equipment. There's no concrete being poured. Uh, Amazon actually is one of the few that poured concrete for warehouses, but you know, the, the old industrial model. So, you know, you, the investments are on the expense side. So mm -hmm. it doesn't look like it's profitable because all its investments are, are ex expenses. Exactly. Exactly. So Paul, who's one of our listeners, would like to know whether you see a difference between purpose-driven companies, strategies, and those that don't have a clear purpose. And, and, you know, this has become a thing, right? We're talking, yeah. I, I can't move without seeing people talking about the power of purpose and the importance of purpose and purpose-led, purpose-driven, um, which is one of those things where I'm like, okay, um, but <laughs> like, how yeah. does that Yeah, well, I don't see a big difference. Mm -hmm. well, the, the difference, is something that is about the leadership. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a difference in working for a leadership that says our purpose is to make a lot of money versus a, a leadership that seems to have something else. Mm -hmm. uh, when Intel was formed, its mission statement was our mission is to make integrated circuits. <laughs> right. And everybody who joined Intel was fascinating. I mean, I was a, I was just coming out of graduate school about the time Intel was formed with my engineering degree. And Intel was a cool place you know, because if you wanted to see the future of microelectronics, you should go to Fairchild or Intel. And that, for me, that was a purpose. 
Okay, I didn't need to hear about social stuff. I wanted to hear about what are they trying to do? And that was exciting. And uh, then I, I went to Jet Propulsion Labs because their purpose was to explore the solar system. And that was pretty cool. It's very exciting. Uh, right? So yeah, in that sense, purpose brings in people who are not primarily motivated by what brings in people to investment banking by making scads of money by the time they're 30. And that's, that's partly the idea is, is, is the purpose is a filter for who's going to join, who's going to join the venture. Uh, and so that's important. But it, it also has to be lived by the senior management. It can't, you just can't write it down. That has nothing to do with anything. It has to be lived by them. They have to be exemplified in the decisions they make and the way they live and where they live, all of that. And you know, if they're, they're lying about it, pretty obvious pretty quickly. Well, yeah, and that gets to this sort of symbolic disconnect, right? So we say we're all about X, but really what I care about is how's the quarter going, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the most fascinating examples of a company that's just deeply embedded with purpose is WD-40 <laughs> under Gary Rich. And I mean, they make stuff that, you know, fixes squeaks. <laughs> and yet those people are running around with their hair on fire about how important this is for the world, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that stuff come from sharks or something? <laughs> I can't remember where they get WD-40 from. Yeah, 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 yeah. It fixes squeaks and it, it, it unfreezes lots in case right. it gets stuck. No, it's, it's, it's super useful. Oh, it's super useful. But, but I mean, what Gary did was um, he talks about having a tribe, you know, and, mm -hmm. and belong to the tribe. And in a way, it kind of fits the narrative you're talking about, which is if we can all commit to an overwhelming challenge. Um, and this has actually been researched a bit, which is what causes people to feel that they belong, that they fit, that they're part of something really important. And I think that's where a lot of this purpose stuff kind of comes from. Um, but it connects very nicely to the notion of if we can all agree on what are critical, critical challenges, then then we can kind of bond with each other in addressing it. Yeah, no, I, I think no, that really makes sense. Um, different people respond to different kinds of purposes. Mm -hmm missions, if you will. You know, the word mission comes to us from, 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 from Catholicism, where people would have on missions to oh, uh -huh. convert uh, the heathens. And uh, that was, that's where we get the word. And it, it's someone who's committed to accomplishing some general purpose. And so you're on a mission uh, and you commit yourself to the mission. Peter Drucker, in his second book on management, said that a company has to have a mission in order to bring in good people. Those people have to be inspired by some larger purpose. Uh, I think that the problem arises, in my mind, is where you get a diversified company trying to claim it has a mission when it's uh, it's a conglomerate of, of products and businesses. And once you have a lot of diversity of products and businesses, you wind up sounding pretty weird mm -hmm. trying to describe what your mission is. Mm -hmm. And you wind up with these things like to make the world a better place, to empower everybody everywhere, to accomplish more. It's just sort of the, the kinds of things you wind up with, which mm -hmm. are not very motivating. Mm -hmm. They're nice. I mean, it's better than to conquer the world and bring everybody under our boot heel. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 fairly bland. Yeah, it's not it's not that specific motivation. I was um, reminded of this um, years ago when I was teaching in our MBA program and uh, was having a chat with two MBAs who were doing their internship, and one had been to Disney and the other had been to Marvel at the time. Oh, yeah. And and both of them loved their internship experiences. And so I was talking to them about what 
what did they find so compelling about their summer with the company? And the woman that went to Marvel was like, oh, you know, it's swashbuckling, it's action. Like our small teens are like pirates and we break the rules and we do all this stuff. And, and the Disney intern was like, oh, you know, we're all treating our guests like their family and we're creating mm -hmm. the happiest place on earth. And, and the two of them are looking at each other like, I would have hated that. <laughs> and either one was was legit, right? But they're That's very right. different places. Right. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And okay. marrying companies together that have cultures is a, a very dangerous and, mm -hmm. and iffy mm -hmm. process. You have different values. You have different ways you work together. You have different pay scales. Um, different structures. It often explodes. Yeah. So one of the um, earlier questions was, um, why just bring the senior people into the foundry? Um, you know, wh why not bring frontline people who know more about what's going on with customers, et cetera? And I have a thought on that, but I'd love to hear your thought first. Well, sometimes it's a good question. Mm -hmm. And because there's too many frontline people to bring into a foundry mm -hmm. is a simple answer that you can't make the group above 10 without it dissolving into a uh, presenter and audience kind of frame. It's gotta be a, a small group discussion in my, in my history, in my, in my view. Um, I have gone and videoed frontline people and brought those videos to the founder. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll go and um, video uh, in, in a, in a in OI, a glass, uh, the glass bottle making company, I, I video a plant manager talking about his issues and his problems in managing the bottle factory. And in another company, I video the, the guy, guy's people operating a, a repair center for a particular product line and talking about their issues. And so, yeah, I, I, I will. And, and in the third example, we broke the foundry at the end of day two and invited some certain tech people to come in by the end of the week, flew them in and finished up on Friday with inputs from the tech people that we decided we needed. So yeah, you can do things like that, but it doesn't work to have a, a room full. Yeah. It's a bigger room, 30 people, it, it, it doesn't work. Well, it sounds to me like the foundry concept is also <laughs> very consistent with your idea of really focusing force where it can make the greatest difference because that's the group that has the most leverage in the company. And if you don't have them aligned, no matter how much input you get from anybody. Well, yeah, and so, you know, to be honest about this and frank about it, <laughs> you go into or do a foundry and you find that the, the senior people are ignorant or incompetent, You have to sit down with the CEO and say, well, you need new senior people. <laughs> or you have to sit down with the board and say, you need a new CEO. Something has to change because, because the senior people should have this information filtering up to them. Yeah. They should understand what the challenges are, things like that. And sometimes the expertise is needed to resolve which challenge is more important or is there anything we can do about this? Yeah, that you may have to need you know, more foundries or something. But, but generally, I I find that in a three day foundry we can get unstuck, mm -hmm. and we can we can begin to do some action. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to do some actual action, you begin to discover new things right away. That opens up the block channels. Mm -hmm. Well, even at Intel, you know, they they talk, I mean, Andy Grove talked about this. He said, you know, in the early days of an inflection point, you need divergence. But once yeah, you've yeah. made up your mind what to do about it, you need convergence. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think a lot of this comes down to where where in the process you are, you know, who whose voices are heard and who's involved. That's right. That's right. And you know, sometimes you you get in an organization and you'll you'll find that they're they're stuck in the past in some mm -hmm. way. They're worshiping a, uh, what did, what did Twain call it? The uh, reification of ephemeral technique. Mm 
Right, right. Another another way of putting that is uh, nostalgia as business. Stress. Yeah. So <laughs> Intel, they for a long time believed that they were their success came from their mastery of Moore's law. And they were successful with Moore's law. They were good at it. But their gross margins of 60% were totally out of line for the rest of the industry. And they weren't due to Moore's law. They were due to the Wintel standard. And that got them messed up because they had a, an incorrect weighting of the causes of their success. And it also made it very unpalatable for people at Intel to do any business that didn't have a big fat gross margin. Same thing happened to IBM. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and so having a, a slightly incorrect view of where your past success has come from can freeze you. Mm -hmm. Well, especially if you're a senior team and that's what got you where you are, right? Yeah, yeah, and that, that belief system percolates all over the place. And then it's, it absolutely does. And uh, Intel has to break that. I mean, they're, they're doubling down on Moore's Law to some extent, but they're also doubling down on that factoring and, and other things, mm -hmm. and AI and new, new chip well, types. And the Chips Act will help them too. I think. But, you know, coming back to your point about we don't manufacture anything anymore. I mean, Andy Grove warned about this in 2010 in a HBR article in which he yes. said, you know, our problem is we're not scaling in the United States and this is going to be bad, folks. And I mean, he laid it out there. And I guess between the structure of incentives and people not taking him seriously, we just gaily yeah. want to and abandon that, right? Well, we've, we've produced, uh, our legal system and, and political system has produced a, a veto society where any small group of people can veto things or hold them up. And, uh, you know, with the combination of uh, NIMBY and ecological and legal and everything else, uh, it's one reason Steve Jobs took manufacturing to China is because you couldn't build a plant in the United States in any time near the, the time scale required. He told, uh, he told President Obama that he needed, I can't remember the number, it was like 30,000 engineers. And he says, you can't find that here in the US. Mm -hmm. and he says, I don't need engineers with degrees from Harvard or Berkeley. I need engineers that know how to mess with materials and make things. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that. He says, we, we don't have 30,000 people like that. And the Chinese have thousands and thousands and thousands. And they do, you try have a, do you have a suggestion or a proposal? Well, the trouble is that that kind of engineering in the US is viewed as, well, well it's shop class. You're going to learn to repair cars. But it's not. Uh, one of the reasons we have trouble building, let's say, nuclear plants is because nobody actually knows how to weld at that level of precision required. The same thing happened with a big dig in Boston. The wells were all bad. And you said, well, why is that? Well, where do people learn how to weld? They learn from other welders, which is back to, you know, the old bricklaying thing. <laughs> you learn to lay bricks from other bricklayers, and it turns out you're laying bricks wrong, which is back with uh, scientific management. Right. <laughs> and, Between the ghost of Frederick Winslow Taylor lives on. There it is, yeah. And so... If I was the king, I would, I would put in place 50 land grant technical schools. Mm -hmm. The problem would be who are the teachers? Mm -hmm. Okay, because we've got to find people that know how to do these things. And most of them are abroad. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to raid Germany in their technical schools. And so you have to start somewhere, though. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't start with 50. Mm -hmm. Interesting because you're going to have to educate the teachers for the next round of technical schools. But if you look at, and I'm not a big fan of, of Chinese engineering, but if you look at the, how they built 20,000 miles of high-speed train, they, one of the things they did is they built these gigantic machines that are just enormous. It's, it's amazing to see them. You know, they're 100 meters long and huge. And, and you see people running around on like tiny little ants on a spaceship. And this machine builds a bridge. Mm. It comes along an existing track and it, it puts out an extension in the front and the middle. 
put down piles and they, they wow. build a bridge across a ravine and then it lays track and then the thing keeps going. And you look at things and say, well, how come we don't have one of those? Because mm -hmm. that's not that's not high-tech aerospace engineering. Or it's not mathematical manipulation of tensor space. It's just plain old engineering. Well, and that's one of the things Ben Fluber talks about, which is that in a lot of these big projects, there's no opportunity for learning. Yeah. And, and that, you know, focusing on the glamorous part, which is like the one time the monuments, the things that are so exciting, actually deprives you of the ability to build skill and capability. by right. the So, yeah, building subways in the U.S. is an expensive process. Some of the most expensive subways in the world were built in New York. And you begin to look at, well, why? Why is it so expensive? Because if you look at Turkey, which builds subways around Istanbul, their material costs are about the same. Their land costs aren't all that different, uh, particularly if you're going underground. Um, labor costs are lower in Turkey, but it turns out that's not critical. Uh, what's critical is the whole consulting political engineering cycle to get the thing designed and going. Yeah. And Turkey has been doing it for 30 years and they have a whole infrastructure that knows how to build a subway. So if you say, let's build a subway from A to B, they sort of know how to do it. And in the US, there's nobody left that knows how to do it. You know, the, you hire consultants who don't know how to do it and they hire consultants to help them. And that's a big part of the expense and, and so on. And it's, it's because you don't do it very often, you don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. People who say, well, let's build nuclear plants. Uh, exactly. Where do you turn for that expertise? The, the guys that built these things in the 60s, oh, they're all retired and dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a fascinating kind of unraveling of, of the difference. Yes, yes, it is. So for those of you that have been putting questions and comments in the chat, I will capture that. And Dick and I will share that after the, the thing. And we'll probably write up some answers for you um, once, once we're not uh, live. But I wanted to finish uh, kind of our time together with um, your your criteria for evaluating the strategy, because we talked about how you get to one, right? We talked about yeah. the challenge of, of you know, defining an actionable set of things you can do about a specific uh, challenge, but you've talked about four criteria. So consistency, consonance, um, ability. <laughs> You're taking me back to the 1960s. I know. So. I know. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> yes. I, I thought I'd just repeat them so you didn't have to remember them off the top of your head. You. Um, but but I think you know it's valuable to remind people that there is a difference between good strategies, which are sort of coherent, and yes. bad strategies, which are just I think you've used the word fluff on many occasions. Um, and I I thought would you like to elaborate on those? Or is, yeah, is sure, your, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, the criteria for a strategy have been refined over time, but yeah, I started out thinking about, you know, how do I tell if this strategy makes any sense? And the, the good strategy, bad strategy book boiled it down to this kernel, which was three, three different concepts or three tests. Uh, one was, is there a diagnosis? Has someone diagnosed the nature of the situation? As in what's going on? What's going on? I heard you give a talk once where you said after the whole semester of teaching, somebody who was observing it said, so Dick, this is all coming down to what's going on here, <laughs> which I thought was a great way of summarizing a strategy class. Right. Yeah, that was uh, that was John Mamer who became dean, who was dean at the time, I think. And uh, but he wanted to, to think about his teaching in the future. He'd come out of a math programming background. And uh, so diagnosis and then guiding policy, which is what most people at the time are calling a strategy, which is how are we going to deal with the issues that we face? How are we, how are we going to compete? And then coherent action, which was sort of consonants, but that action should be coherent, that you shouldn't do things that fight each other that if you want to reduce fossil fuel use in the US, you shouldn't be going to Venezuela and begging for more oil. Uh, on the other, you know, so you, the, these sort of policies that fight each other get in the way and confuse the situation. Mm -hmm. um, if you, and, and typically people start out with, with goals that fight each other. They don't even realize it, that let's make the company 
uh, a higher return on investment and faster liquids. Well, if you're not going to invest, where's the anyway? Some of these goals fight each other, and actions can fight each other. Uh, so those tests, and then in the crux, I really focus on diagnosis much more. Yeah, just for those of you that didn't see the cover of the book, we are. <laughs> so in, in good, best strategy, bad strategy, you know, I said you got to have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And in the crux, I'm saying the diagnosis has to be about challenges. And the challenges have to be sorted into importance and uh, addressability. And you got to find out to really decide if there's a, if you could do a challenge, you have to look at the crux, which is the hardest, you know, the hardest part of it, and so on. And then I, I also spend a fair amount of time on coherence, which again is a, is a difficult subject to. Uh, A lot of things can can cohere, but you really want to avoid incoherence, where you, you've got policies that fight each other. Oh, totally. Can I give you one of my most favorite reasons? Yeah, sure. So um, I had a, a gentleman in class who was working for um, Time Warner, uh, you know, the entertainment company, which got itself acquired by AT&T, which I thought at the time was likely to be a disaster. But um, <laughs> so he said to me, um, one of the first actions they took after the acquisition finally got approved by the Department of Justice, they're all coming together to do these integration meetings and this and that. And he said to me, well, so this delegation of HR people from AT&T comes and visits them at their Time Warner offices. Um, and he says, okay, well, one of the first things we need to do is make sure that you as an entertainment entertainment company have everybody adhere to AT&T corporate policies, <laughs> among which is everybody's got to pass a drug test. Mm. Talking about rock and roll people and people in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have no talent left by the end of the day. So I think that's a great example of what you were just talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's incoherent. And uh my life, most of the examples that we love in, in teaching strategy courses of the great strategy companies are very tightly knit. Mm -hmm. Tend to be not out in all sorts of different businesses, and that that helps with coherence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it but, helps. Uh, you have similar business models too across. Yeah, so like, you know, Disney now is getting it getting itself twisted, trying to figure out the coherence between its new social interest, social justice stuff, and it's the fact that it's you know, basically a, a safe children's place. You know, how do they square that circle or circle that square or whatever it is, you know? So they have some incoherence there that's causing them some difficulty. Yeah, yeah, it's a great example. Um, well, look, I don't, I don't want to impose too much more on your time, but perhaps leave us with some ideas about where people can learn more so they can definitely buy the book. Um, other places they should be looking for some of these insights? Well, there's, there's other great books out there on strategy, and they should look at Rita McGrath. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Uh, they should. What is the good stuff to look at? Um, I read a lot of military strategy mm -hmm. stuff. I read not not so much the, the the academic stuff. I read about what the military is writing about their their experiences. They're much better at reviewing what went wrong <laughs> than business people are. Mm. Um, well, they have a they have a whole well. As I always tell people, you know, we like to use military analogies in business. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is real competition. Like, you get this wrong, you are yeah. dead. <laughs> like, it's not like you lost some money. <laughs> so they have to be a little more focused on what can we learn and how do we do it better next time. Um, you, you sort of caught me here. Oh, I didn't mean to. No, I just meant to learn more about you, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, look, what I'll do is um, I'll take a copy of all the comments that have been posted in the chat. I'll share them with you, and we'll see if we can get a little write-up. Um, and we'll make that uh, available, and then people can ask more questions if they're still curious. Sure. Um, there's, there's lots of interesting topics out there. You know, I don't really read – I read everybody – 
who writes about strategy. I take a look mm -hmm. at what they have to say. There's very little new being said, mm -hmm. but it's a literary form like a cookbook. You know, there's, there's different recipes and different ideas floating around. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to spend my time thinking about problems. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I'm trying to take California, which wants to outlaw gasoline-powered cars by 2035. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to say, well, what would an actual strategy look like for California? What if they actually had a strategy instead of an ambition? Mm -hmm. What would be? What would it look like? Uh, and so that's a, that's something I'm doing. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm, I'm doing the same thing with the national defense strategy. And so that's how I, you know, if you look at on my desk and what I'm trying to write, I'm looking at, at problems in some sense and noodling around with all the people who thought about that problem. And they're not strategy thinkers. They're just people who've done studies, thought about it, some have broader perspectives than others. And, and you'll learn a lot by doing that. You'll learn a lot by, more by looking at real problems and real thought solutions to those problems than you do by, let's say, reading strategy books. Uh, I just have to say, even including my own. Grappling with really hard problems mm -hmm. is, is the exercise. Mm -hmm. It's invigorating. Yeah. Well, I think one of the unfortunate things about management books in general, business books in general, is, you know, they've kind of become the ticket to a lot of other things. And so, yes. they're, they're, you know, I, I personally think we've kind of reached peak book. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what comes next. But maybe one, one, of the, one of the reviews of my book on Amazon, I, I don't know who wrote it, but it says business books typically are self-help books. They're not really about business. Mm -hmm. They're about perfecting your soul. And this book is actually about business, which is cool. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, as I promised, I will follow up with uh, your questions and comments. Um, and uh, to be continued, lovely to chat with you in the new year, Dick. Rita, nice to see you in, on, on Zoom. <laughs> and maybe you hear from who knows. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We'll talk soon then. Bye-bye.